It's President's Day 2010. We're at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. Uh, we've just finished the second Nixon Legacy Forum, this one on the organization and management of the President's time. And one of the uh, participants was Steve Bull, who really was the principal manager of the President's time. Uh, there at the uh, there at the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night. Um, how did you meet? How did you come to that job? Really, kind of accidentally. Um, I was working for a soft drink company, Canada Dry Corporation, in 1968. Had been shortly out of the Marine Corps, and um, became sort of, sort of the executive assistant to a brand new CEO. They brought in a dynamic young guy by the name of David Mahoney, who had been with. Um, Colgate Palmolive as the executive vice president. And he always had a young guy hanging around him. And I was the only young guy in, uh, in the company. Um, and so I became his executive assistant. Sometime in the springtime of 1968, he got the form letter from the Nixon campaign uh, looking for uh, young people to be uh, donated as advance men. Mahoney received, would have received that letter because he had been active, I think probably just financially, in earlier Nixon campaign. So it was a good time for me to take a leave of absence. I was, I was a Republican. That was my inclination anyway. So I took a leave of absence and, and went to work as an advance man, always expecting to return to Canada Dry Corporation. Near the end of the campaign, Larry Higby uh, asked if I would be interested in coming down to Washington um, after uh, Mr. Nixon won. I mean, I, I believe it was not through any great accomplishment, but rather the fact that the Nixon campaign had a bunch of old men, so kind of an old man's image, and they wanted some young faces. And so I and, and a guy named John Brown and another guy, Jay Wilkinson, um, and, and of course Larry Higby, who was already very active in the campaign, but we were brought down to work in rather amorphous positions with, um, with Bob Haldeman. But we were kind of the young faces down there. Um, and then about three months into uh, the, the presidency, we had a realignment of responsibilities. Dwight Chapin, who had been the personal assistant to the president, moved up to a more substantive position, and I moved into the position as, in effect, the president's personal aide. And eventually it became kind of the, you know, uh, op operating the, the, the manager or the management of the Oval Office and, and, more importantly, the management of the president's or implementation of the president's schedule. Uh, before we get into that briefly, you talked very vividly uh, in, your, uh, in some of your remarks this afternoon about the situation in 19, in the late 60s, and particularly in 68, the tremendous changes that this country <clears throat> was going through and then went through, and that, that today are either forgotten or idealized. Uh, yeah. What mm -hmm. was, uh, just tell us some of that experience. That well, I mean, I started, I mentioned today that a generation is normally about 20 years. But in the mid-60s, a generational change took place in a one-year period. I left the country to go to Vietnam in 1960, in June of, May or June of, of 1965. And during the time that I was over there, the world exploded. It exploded with racial unrest, campus unrest, uh, growing drug use, um, the beginning of anti-war sentiment that evolved uh, in, the, in the ensuing three or four years in anti-American sentiment as practiced by Americans in this country. And so when I came back after 12 months, it was a different country. I just didn't understand it. And as I said, a, a, a week after I was back in the country, I was in New York City, now I was, I'd been released from active duty from the Marine Corps, looking for a job, and the first thing I see is a bunch of scraggly kids uh, marching down Park Avenue carrying Viet Cong and North Viet Vietnamese flags chanting Ho 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 Chi Minh, the NLF is going to win. NLF is the National Liberation Front, the communist organization in, in uh, North and South Vietnam. And I was just aghast. I mean, we would have dealt with that group of people with extreme prejudice and, 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 and legitimately, legitimately so a week earlier had it been in Vietnam. It was just a different world. And then we know the, the, the tragic events that un unfolded, including um, uh, the, the uh, assassination of, of um, Martin Luther King and, and then Robert F. Kennedy. And the world was, uh, as I said, figuratively and, and very often literally in flames. The sociology, sociology buildings at the University of Wisconsin were being blown up in the interest of peace. Strange time.
What, uh, as briefly as you can, I mean, it would take hours to begin to uh, describe it. Describe your job in the Nixon White House in the West Wing. Uh, to implement the president's schedule, get people in and out of the president's office, to um, respond to his request for more mechanical, mundane needs from uh, time to time, but also kind of the unspoken, um, undefined responsibility was to know the man. We, it was a master-slave relationship, senior subordinate relationship, and there was no question who held what position, which was fine with me. First of all, I was 26 years old. Second, I was just out of the Marine Corps, and I dealt with seniors all the time. The only difference there, with, now in the White House, I didn't have to salute. Um, but it was, it was to be there, anticipate what the president's need, uh, needs might be, to very often to gauge his temperament. Um, and to try to uh, anticipate and respond to inquiries from people as, that might include Henry Kissinger about whether it might be a good time or not a good time to go in to see him. You had a very funny and, and charming uh, description of, uh, your, uh, of when you and the president were alone in the Oval Office. Yeah, well, I, I, I said that, I mean, in his mind, you know, in his mind, I think he, he felt that he was alone, that I would just blend in. Which is the highest praise for, your, for I, you doing I your job. I hope so. I hope so, yeah. Um, because it, it would suggest that he, he trusted me. And um, as we, we've noted that trust was, was such an important element of the operation of the White House. And it's such an important element in a relationship that people have to a, a senior. Uh, you know, in the news right now, we're, we're hearing about this young fellow who worked as, a, as an assistant, personal assistant to Senator John Edwards, and he's written a tell-all book. It's fun reading, but I'm just, the betrayal of trust is something that I, I can't countenance. And back as it relates to the way we dealt with one another in, in the Nixon White House, and certainly with the president, it's something that never would have been tolerated. One of the uh, questions we were taking uh, for this forum, uh, instead of taking questions from the audience, because we only had a limited amount of time, we took questions from the internet uh, on the new Nixon uh, blog on the website for the last uh, 10 or 12 days. We've been inviting questions from uh, anyone in the country or around the world. One of them came from uh, Luke Nichter, who's a, uh, a history professor in Texas and has uh, been very interested in the Nixon tapes and indeed has a, a, a mm -hmm. website that he has uh, really pioneered, devoted to these. And uh, he asked a question about how did people <clears throat> in the staff feel when they realized or when they learned uh, that pretty much everything uh, that they had been uh, involved with had uh, in, in the public rooms had been taped. Well, I can only tell you how, how I felt. Um, first of all, as you know, um, I became the keeper of the tapes after Alex Butterfield left the White House. And it was Alex Butterfield who revealed, and I think quite accidentally, not, not deliberately, certainly not with malice or any ulterior motive, uh, to the Senate Watergate Committee that there was a taping system and he responded to a question and um, it came out. Um, I was surprised, once I learned of the taping system, um, I was surprised that I hadn't figured it out earlier. Just because of the manner in which certain things happened and the way Alex would from time to time do some things or ask a question, just conduct himself. So I should have figured out that there was a taping system in the Oval Office, because my office was contiguous to the Oval Office, and I was in and out of it the whole time. But I became the keeper of the tapes. Um, I, can't re I can't give you an answer about how everyone else felt when they learned about it. I mean, that's how I felt about it. But of course, was, you know, the, because I was so intimately involved with how, the tapes. How was it that you felt? Well, <clears throat> I thought, good. And I felt, thought, you know, not immediately, but in June or July when the uh, Senate Watergate Committee hearings began and John Dean was making some rather serious allegations, 
I, perhaps through naivety, perhaps through blind loyalty, whatever, thought that um, we had those tapes and we would just let John Dean go out on that limb and keep sawing on it and those tapes would cause that limb to come crashing to the ground. So I, I, I guess after a couple of months, I viewed them as our secret weapon that would prove exculpatory of the president and, and, and others. Uh, you talked about uh, people, uh, that, that your job was, one of the elements of your job was to know the man, to, mm -hmm. to, to sense the man. What do you know about him? What did you learn? And not, not, not like the Andrew Young experience. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you know about him that, uh, that you think people today don't but should know about him? I suppose they all know of, of his intellect, of his seriousness of purpose. Um, I don't know how instructive it is for people to know that he is, was somewhat of a shy man. Um, he was a person who, for whatever reason, didn't have a great deal of trust in a whole lot of people. And arguably, you can say, and not just a critic, you might say it even as a, as, a, as a supporter, he may have put too much trust in too few people. Um, and some of it may have been improperly directed. Tell, I know we're, we're very short on time here, but I want you to tell a story which is going to appall a lot of people. And I should warn PETA supporters that they should probably, uh, assuming any are watching us now, which is a, uh, an assumption, uh, that they should probably tune out. Talk about, uh, you, you, talk about the, the Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it, it was a tradition dating back to the presidency of Harry Truman for the, I think it's the American Turkey Federation or National Turkey Federation, to present a turkey to the president, th thus signifying the beginning of Thanksgiving week. And it was just fraught with disaster, at least during the Nixon years. The first year we did it, the bird and we would always do this in the Rose Garden. It would be an outside event. So the press would be lined up. The first year we did this, the bird took off and flew right into the faces of the, the press. The second year, it had some sort of a fit and lost half its feathers flying through the air. The third year, it, it, turkeys are big. I mean, and they're big, strong animals. It lifted uh, one of its wings and almost knocked the president over. So the fourth year, we'd ask them, you know, to, Please do something to, you know, calm the bird so we won't have another incident. Well, everything went fine. Uh, after the event was over, we, we, we looked over and, you know, that there was the turkey on this wooden table out there. And we saw that his, its webbed feet had been nailed to the table. So I, I, I hasten to add uh, to those who are still listening uh, that the, 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 the most you had in mind was maybe the judicious application of a little turkey valium. <laughs> right. That that, was, uh, that that was not the work of the some White House. Some of the House. chemical substances that some of the right. kids outside the gates were using on a regular basis. Steve Bull, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.